a little sip of water. It's not tea, but you know. <laughs> hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. The past month or so has been really weird. And if we were to find a silver lining to any of this craziness, it's that I've had a little bit of time to research and ruminate on certain topics that I've always wanted to do a video about, but have never had the time to fully craft the behemoth of a YouTube video that that certain topic would require. So here we are talking about tracing. Before I get even in slightly into the topic, I want to just point out a couple disclaimers. One, I have some new equipment. So for the first time in my life, I have a very long script that I'm trying to read off of. So if it looks like I'm not looking at the camera, that's why I am learning. This is a work in progress. And second, you know, I, even though there's new technology, the sun is still my resource for lighting, so it might look stupid. But the point of this video is not so much to be looking at me. This is mostly going to be lecture-based. Think of me as just pontificating out into the world. But there will be some visual aids, so feel free to glance up at the screen every once in a while because there will be some things that you might want to take a look at. Anyway, we have a lot to do and my battery life is only so long. So <laughs> let's just dive straight in. What do I mean by tracing? We need to get on the same page about this before we can talk about all the various issues. So definition. By tracing, I'm talking specifically about copying line for line something finished, whether that be a photo you took yourself a photo found on the internet, or even a drawing you like on Instagram. Transferring a process of taking a sketch or something unfinished and copying it onto another surface to be used in the final product is a form of tracing, but it is not something I'll be covering in this video because it doesn't seem to cause a lot of controversy with artists and non-artists. People have an issue with tracing because it's seen as cheating or lazy or deceiving because you're cutting corners by taking something finished and using it in your work rather than just doing every single step yourself. If you were to trace over a photograph and then transfer that drawing onto a surface to paint, the problem is in the first step, not in the second. Tracing is usually conflated with stealing or copying, so it's seen as morally reprehensible. Are these perceptions of tracing true, false, or somewhere in the middle? That's the question we'll be attempting to answer in this video. Tracing as technique. One of the complaints I hear the most is, but tracing is a crutch. It hinders young artists from learning and growing. It makes professional artists rusty. If you have the skill, why even bother tracing in the first place? So let's break that down. Is tracing a crutch? Short answer, no. Long answer, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If your goal is to learn how to render different textures like hair and skin, tracing makes perfect sense because you're not wasting your time drawing the outlines of things first. That time saved means more time improving the area of interest. If your goal is to get better at line art, Copying a master of line art helps study your hand and learn where to thicken and thin the lines. I could list more examples, but basically tracing can either be a shortcut to learning another important art skill or the very act of tracing becomes a teaching method. There's a reason art teachers ask their students to do master copies of famous works like those of da Vinci. In high school, university, and art school, I had to do master copies, which is just a tracing of a drawing by a master artist. And at first glance, this kind of seems like a dumb assignment <laughs> because people have this impression that tracing is mindless and you don't really learn anything, but this isn't entirely the case. As the staff of Artist Network so perfectly put it, fundamentally, tracing uses the same mental process that's required to draw from life. You'll be using the same coordination between the eye and the hand that you need to render a face or figure from a live model. Model. The reason is simple. When you draw the form you see before you, you're virtually tracing that form in your mind. Your eye sees a segment of a line, for instance, and your mind retains that image as you mentally project it onto the paper's surface. You then trace that mental image by drawing a line that matches the one in your own mind's eye. Thus, when you're physically tracing a drawing, you're teaching yourself to trace images mentally. Tracing teaches the mind, as well as the hand, how and where to make marks. Sometimes when I traced for an assignment, I was really focused on what I was doing, and other times I put on Netflix in the background, and I kind of half paid attention to what I was doing. Regardless of how concentrated I was, I still made loads of discoveries while tracing, such as how to render rib cages, contorted muscle, or what certain body parts looked in perspective. And I wasn't a super noob artist at the time either. I totally had the skills to render those images without tracing, but the act of tracing still taught me new and insightful things. If you don't believe me, ask yourself when was the last time you traced? Most of us stay so far away from tracing that we can't see or remember the potential benefits. But seriously, give tracing a go and it, I think you'll be shocked how much you can learn from such a 
mindless practice. I also want to point out how tracing flips the artist's process in a way that is both positive for artistic growth and positive for mental endurance. When an artist is learning something new and difficult for the first time, like anatomy, it's crazy easy to get discouraged because of how often you fail. You know how that arm or hand or whatever is supposed to look, and you're seeing it in front of you, but for some reason you just can't get it. I can't tell you how many figure drawing classes I went to where some students really didn't make much progress, and not for lack of effort or hours practice. They were doing the same amount of work inside and outside of class as everyone else, but they just couldn't quite figure out where the lines should go. That's where tracing is a blessing. Rather than creating something from nothing and seeing it fall apart before your eyes, you're given the chance to work backwards and be shown how it's properly done. This probably isn't a perfect example, but imagine trying to learn how to play an instrument totally by yourself versus having a teacher physically hold your hands where they ought to go. Another example could be karaoke and how the machine shows you when to sing, what to sing, and what pitch to sing at. Starting from scratch again and again is important for sure, but it can be incredibly beneficial to use tracing as a way to accelerate the learning process. Not to mention, it's incredibly disheartening as a young artist to feel like you're always failing. Creating something good, even if it's not entirely your own, is motivating, encouraging, and provides enough satisfaction for the artist to keep trudging along with practicing the hard stuff. If everything you make is bad, it's it's easy to become discouraged and quit. How many potential artists have quit because they just didn't have the mental fortitude to create stacks of crappy art? And how many potential artists can we grow and nurture by giving them all the teaching tools, not just the ones we deem morally the best? There's also this idea that tracing is easy, automatically makes your art look amazing, and ultimately can be used as an act of deception. That the artist you like isn't nearly as talented as you think they are. This is not entirely true. If your line art is shaky, or the line weight makes no sense, or you have a hard time finding the lines you're supposed to be drawing in the first place, for example, a torso with ribs showing underneath, I mean, what the heck do you do with that? The drawing immediately looks bad. This is an issue seen primarily with super, super noob artists who haven't learned how to study their hand. The best example I can come up with to demonstrate the difficulty of tracing is none other than Henry Fox Talbot, one of the inventors of photography. I took a history of photography class as an elective in college and learned back in the 1800s, people would trace the world around them by shining light through a prism and having their surroundings be refracted onto their sketchbook page. Apparently, <laughs> Talbot was so hot at tracing and partially frustrated, partially inspired, and maybe partially embarrassed, he set off to invent the camera. What does that tell you about the apparent ease of tracing? And let's not forget all the other aspects of a drawing, like rendering, color, lighting, etc., that tracing alone can't solve. If the artist isn't very skilled, those weaknesses will still pop out. Tracing does not automatically make you a master artist especially considering that the artist in question will still need to, at some point, draw something without tracing. And at that point, the whole facade crumbles. At this point, I have to pause and address the protests I can already hear forming in your minds. What about people who trace something that isn't a master copy or photograph? What about people who trace stylized work that is genuinely unique to another artist? Tracing is not the perfect teaching tool. Like anything else, it has its limitations. Tracing over realistic imagery teaches fundamental skills in art, but tracing stylized work really only teaches you how to draw in that person's style. You don't learn how to draw the actual thing you're drawing, i.e. the proportions and characteristics that it has in real life, and you don't know how to take that real thing and stylize it yourself. You literally only learn how to draw that object in the artist's style. Nothing more, nothing less. And especially when said stylized subject is something unique and created by the original artist, like anime characters, you tracing over their work not only doesn't teach much, but it does run into some copyright issues, which is a topic we'll discuss later. Young artists tracing over images of their favorite anime characters and cartoons really is fun and can teach a bit about stylization, but it's still not really beneficial. In the case of teaching, use tracing over realistic, copyright-free images and leave the stylized original artwork alone. Creating a style or original work comes after learning the basics. Now, this all sounds good for young artists, but what does this mean for professional artists who use tracing? If they have the skill, why trace in the first place? Aren't they letting themselves get rusty? And to that I say, I think it's a case-by-case -case basis, but in general, I'm not totally convinced that there's any situation where an artist is truly becoming 
rusty. Take, for example, a hyper-realistic painter, one of those types who paints every pore, every hair, every tiny detail. They absolutely use different tracing and transferring techniques to get all the contours and proportions just so before committing to rendering every bit of minutia. And you could argue, well, isn't that just paint by numbers? But you'd be very hard-pressed to find a lesser skilled artist who could accomplish that same level of craft even if they had the exact same paint by numbers guide. And going back to my earlier points of tracing isn't easy and tracing is a teaching tool, it must be noted that these artists are still spending hours of time drawing the very thing they're tracing. Let's say an artist traces portraits every day. Do you really think that if that artist sat down to draw a face without tracing, do you really think that if that artist sat down to draw a face without tracing that they wouldn't be able to do it? God no. They literally spend every single day drawing faces. It's not like they aren't painfully familiar with their subject matter, even if they aren't doing the hard work of creating everything from scratch. I'm sure said artists would still have a more difficult time than if they just traced, but the act of making faces is still in their artistic toolkit. Professional and experienced artists have incredible skill, and they wouldn't be in the position they're in without spending countless hours on their craft. Those hyper-realistic painters I was mentioning earlier could undoubtedly sketch everything out without the aids of tracing and transferring, but the reason they don't brings me to my next point. Professional artists using tracing or transferring as part of their process is not a result of them being lazy. These artists have deadlines and buyers to deal with. In a lot of cases, the more popular the artist, the less time they have to make a piece. For example, editorial artists who sometimes have to create a piece from scratch in only a couple hours. Things like tracing greatly speed up the process in the same way that other technology speeds up the process. For example, using a printer and scanner to blow up a small sketch that can later be transferred onto a canvas. Using tools at your disposal does not make you a bad artist painstakingly doing every step by hand does not make you a great artist. Art directors, galleries, buyers, etc. primarily care about the final product. They care about how much they're paying for it and how much money it'll make them. The suffering of the artist behind the scenes does not necessarily translate into dollar amounts. Professional artists know this and choose to work in a manner that best suits their needs and the needs of their clients. So does this make them lazy? No, it makes them smart. Which brings me to my next topic. Process versus product. In one of the articles I read, artist Matt Fussell perfectly summarizes the tracing problem. If you value the product over the process, you'll think tracing is fine. If you value the process over the product, you'll think tracing is bad. There aren't many situations, at least that I can think of, where the process is more important than the product. The final piece of art is what gets sold in galleries, is what gets hung on walls, is what is posted online, is what an artist is known for, etc. And in almost all cases, we the viewer don't know the process that went into that work of art. If you go into an art gallery and don't read the wall tags, you probably won't know the artist's process or even what materials they use to make it, but you can skip the wall tags and still enjoy the art. Now, you may cry out, but the process is important. Look at Jackson Pollock. His fame came more from how he used paint than from the paintings themselves. Yes, you're absolutely right. In some cases, the process is incredibly important to understanding and admiring the artwork. Contemporary art hung in galleries and museums tend to place a greater emphasis on the process than other fields because process plays an important role in the idea or narrative behind the piece. I'm not dismissing process as something uninteresting or unimportant. I'm just saying that for the vast majority of art made, like children's books or comic books or animation or basically anything that exists outside of a gallery, you knowing the process isn't more important than the art itself. And to that Jackson Pollock comment, would we even care about his process if his art, his product, didn't get famous in the first place? Food for thought. I have a theory that social media is placing a greater emphasis on process than ever before. Think about it. For most of human history, just getting to see artwork in person was a big deal. Ancient Romans didn't have Instagram to look at Michelangelo's David from the comfort of their own home. You had to actually go and see it for yourself. Even in the 20th century, the life of the artist was still a more private affair. We have photographs of artists working in their studios, but it's not like the public was privy to all the behind the scenes details in just a couple clicks. With social media, it's encouraged for people to be authentic by sharing bits of their life. And considering how long it takes to make a single work of art versus how quick the pace of social media is, it makes sense for artists to post sketches, studies, and other glimpses of behind the scenes. It humanizes them. It keeps them in the public eye. A win-win. And people really love it. I mean, look at all the TikToks of people sketching and painting, or all the likes a single picture of a used paint palette will get on Instagram. Because we now have access to the process, we place more value on the process. We as followers become enamored with the painting before it's even finished because we're seeing all the steps go 
on into making it. We feel like the artist is our friend because we see them as often on our feeds as we do our own friends. Never before in art history has this happened, and I'm willing to bet that this rise in disgust over tracing matches the rise in people seeing the process. I feel like we, we hold artists to a very high standard. They're the creators of culture, and therefore everything they create is sacred, which Sounds maybe like a stretch, but look at how we admire certain artists even centuries after their death. You may know more names of artists than names of politicians. So when we see something that at first glance feels like cheating, in this case, tracing, we feel offended, we feel deceived, and our respect plummets. Judgment. Think about how you felt seeing the title of this video. Just the word tracing probably provoked some strong emotions. Maybe you felt anger, disgust, had the urge to roll your eyes. You probably wondered why this video was so long when tracing should be as simple as don't do it, the end. You may even have prepared yourself to yell at me for even thinking of defending tracing, all before you even watched the video, just from the very word. And I don't blame you. There have been YouTube scandals involved with tracing, and in the past, I have very gleefully clicked on them, pitchfork at the ready, just because tracing is so controversial. At best, some people will say something like, well, I guess it's okay so long as you credit the artist, photographer, model, are explicitly clear that you trace and the image isn't yours and never ever monetize it, but really you just should never trace in the first place. That's the warmest answer you'll get, really. And of the artists I chatted with about tracing, the ones who are negative towards it did say things like that, but when pressed for more information, their repulsion for tracing was exposed even under the best of circumstances. Ultimately, tracing as a whole is frowned upon. Artists and non-artists know this. Because of this negative feeling, we don't really give tracing a second thought, let alone a chance to actually dissect the topic to see if our initial feelings are valid. Any artist who traces without any kind of mentioning of doing so or credit and then later gets called out is hardcore canceled. They lose a ton of followers, people bash them on social media, it's altogether a super bad look. For example, a year or so ago, YouTube artist Holly Brown found herself in hot water when it was discovered that she had traced a character from an anime. Not terribly long later, YouTube artist Ross Draws got in trouble for tracing over a model without transforming it enough and without crediting the original model. In both cases, the whole YouTube art community freaked out and there were whole commentary videos being made to discuss the scandals. If you want to learn more about those dramas, I've linked a couple informative videos about it down below. Anyway, even if you follow the rules of tracing, people, including other artists, will judge you behind your back for it. If you make a great piece of art and people love it and then reveal that you use tracing in order to make it, people's opinion of the piece will drop dramatically and people's respect for you will drop. It doesn't matter if you do the reveal at the time of posting or later on, you will still receive scorn. You might not really get burned if you're a small artist, but you better believe if you're a large artist, there will be rage against you. Or if not rage, hella, hella, a judgment to your face or behind your back. Up until my last year of college, my experiences with tracing have been negative. For example, when I was maybe 15 or so, I did a digital illustration of Bridget Bardot for my dad's Father's Day gift. Both my parents really liked it until they asked if I had traced. I said I did and I could immediately feel their disapproval. All their love for the piece disappeared. The art was put in a drawer and didn't see the light of day for almost a decade. I was really hurt because one, I literally witnessed my parents' view of my art just plummet in the span of a single sentence, and two, I traced because I knew my skills weren't good enough to capture her likeness. Had I tried to draw from reference, it would have looked like any other blonde girl and my dad wouldn't have really liked the gift, but he ended up not liking it anyway because I traced. It felt like a double-edged sword. My second experience with tracing came a lot later when I was a first semester sophomore at UConn. After visiting a tattoo parlor with my friends, by the way, mom, dad, and all family members watching this, I do not have a tattoo. This story is not about that. It is about my friends. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I briefly considered a career in tattooing and ended up getting my portfolio reviewed by one of the artists. One of the pieces I showed him was some homework from my figure drawing class. We had to do four line drawings of our feet. Basically, the guy looked at my drawing and asked, did you trace this? And I was immediately offended and defensive and told him I hadn't traced, it was just from reference, etc. He was kind of taken aback by this and was basically like, I wasn't asking to accuse you of anything. I was just wondering because a lot of tattoo artists trace. He was very nonchalant about the whole thing, but to me, his words stung. I had worked so hard to get good enough that I didn't need to trace. And now that I had mastered the skills, people thought it was traced anyway. Again, a double-edged sword. My only positive experience when it came to tracing was in my senior year at MassArt. My editorial illustration professor asked us to create a portrait of our favorite music artist as an illustration for Rolling Stone magazine. One of the guys in my class did this amazing realistic portrait of a rapper he liked. My professor asked him if he had traced it, and the guy reacted the same way I did at the tattoo artist. Shocked, a little offended, and very defensive. He hadn't traced, he had spent hours and hours working on that portrait just from reference. My teacher, very calmly I might add, 
said, it looks so realistic that it looks traced. So why not trace it? It would save you a lot of time. Me and my other classmates got freaking whiplash because, well, he was totally right. It's just that we had never been told that tracing could be a good thing, especially from an art teacher. And slight tangent, but I should also remind you that this was an editorial illustration class. Because editorial illustrators have insanely tight deadlines, they have to produce work quickly. My teacher had dozens of stories where he had to create an illustration from scratch in literally only a few hours. The average length of time is only a few days. All of this is to say is that his comment about speed being important is 100% legitimate, which made his comment about tracing all the more baffling. It was a complete 180 of what he had al we had always been taught, and yet it made so much sense. So now that you have all this backstory, I hope you will understand where I'm about to go with this topic, the real can of worms in this video. This year's Melanin March 2020, I ended up tracing almost all of my drawings. I did not start the challenge thinking I wanted to trace, but it was taking me forever to do the drawings. The first handful of drawings I was able to complete without tracing and they looked very accurate and realistic because I do know what the heck I'm doing, dang it. It's just that one, it took up a lot of time that I didn't have and two, it was maddening trying to get every feature just so and knowing that one part was wonky, but after 10 tries, I just couldn't get it right. Eventually, I started putting the photographs underneath the line art to correct whatever aspect was wrong. The lines I drew myself lined up almost perfectly with the photo underneath. It was just usually one little area like the jawline that was off. So I would trace over that one wonky bit so I could just move on with the piece. And then it hit me. If I'm going to trace small parts anyway, and more to the point, if it's going to look the same regardless of whether or not I trace, then why not just save a ton of time and trace the whole thing anyway? This last point is proved true because not a single person called me out for tracing or if they did notice, no one cared. Everyone assumed that I had just used the photos as reference because duh, it still looked like my style. And if you compare my first few pieces where I didn't trace with my later pieces where I did trace, there's really no difference at all. The product was identical, even though my process had changed and absolutely no one was the wiser. At first, I felt guilty, like I was cheating. But over time, I realized just how much time I was saving. Thanks to tracing, I was actually able to stick to the challenge and finish a drawing a day. Had I not traced, I never would have been able to keep up. It's important to note that Melanin March has a lot of positive qualities that aren't limited to just being about representation. It's also about practicing drawing and coloring different kinds of people. In 2017, the year that I started Melanin March, I wrote in my first post, the goal is to practice anatomy and skin tones, as well as bring more diversity to my artwork. And and that goal has persisted every year, though I don't always publicly announce what I aim to work on. This year in particular, I wanted to practice rendering skin and trying different kinds of color palettes. In 2019, I wanted to draw realistic faces without reference. In 2018, I wanted to get back in touch with traditional art as well as learn about different cultures. In 2017, the birth year of Melanin March, absolutely everything was about learning, from rendering skin to drawing faces to learning cultures to drawing full bodies, etc. This also goes back to my previous experiences with tracing. When I didn't have have much skill, tracing was a bad thing. And when I did have skill, people thought I traced. The only reason the tattoo artist didn't look down on me is because he came from a field where tracing is totally normal and acceptable. I mean, think about it. Their art is on someone's body forever. They can't risk an unhappy client just because their morals say they shouldn't trace. And even if I hired an amazing tattoo artist to tattoo a portrait of Michelle Obama on me, I would still feel more comfortable knowing that they had traced than if they didn't. That shit needs to be effing perfect. But anyway, these points ask two opposing questions. One, if everyone's opinion of tracing is negative, no matter what your skill level, then why bother tracing? But also two, if other tools like scanners, printers, paint retarders, and other tools are all available for your speed and convenience, why should tracing be treated differently? And the common denominator of both questions is simple. Tracing conflicts with our moral compass. Internet drama in cancel culture. People on the internet tend to be sensitive to issues like copying, tracing, or stealing art, as they rightly should be, but there are some more vocal people who are merciless when they think they've caught someone in the act, even if there's very little evidence to support their claims. Let's say an artist creates something entirely on their own, no tracing or help whatsoever. If one of their followers thinks that the artist copied another, that follower will attack the artist anyway. For example, a few years ago, I made a video called How I Draw Detailed Backgrounds. In the video, I demonstrated my thought process for how I draw a college girl's living room. When it came time for me to create the thumbnail, I realized I didn't have any good photos of the final work. So rather than try to take a better photo, I went the lazy way and used a picture of a painting of the Massar computer lab 
because it still fit the topic of detailed backgrounds and it was at the ready on my hard drive. And I didn't think anything of it at the time, which in hindsight was a grave error because the painting in the thumbnail and the sketch in the video were nothing alike and led to several people complaining about being misled or clickbaited. I felt really bad about it, but by the time I realized I needed a good photo of the sketch for that thumbnail, I had already colored it in and used the final image for my next video, how I color an interior. So if I were to use the same image in both, it would have looked really weird. And also the colored version for the sketch video still would have looked kind of clickbaity. So it was a bad move. That's on me. I was a lot younger and more naive. What can I say? But then people started questioning if the art in the thumbnail was even mine. One person literally commented, you used someone else's art for the thumbnail and didn't even give them credit, you stinky bitch. I can't even say this. Again, this was literally my painting. <laughs> Thank God I caught the comment early and thank God I had posted a photo of me literally holding the painting in front of the subject matter so I could hardcore prove that the art was mine. The person immediately backed off and was pretty embarrassed, but it perfectly illustrates my point. I posted a picture of my own art and got accused by multiple people of stealing only because the painting didn't match what I made in the video, which really is just a shred of evidence and I roll my eyes to even call it that. An artist can be completely innocent and still be accused of doing something wrong. And then it's all on the artist to fix the mess that the artist apparently made. That example doesn't technically relate to tracing. So let me remind you of my other tracing experiences. My drawings were not traced, but the artist at the tattoo parlor thought they were. The guy in my editorial class did not trace, but the teacher thought it was. People in real life and on the internet may incorrectly think you traced based on no information besides what they see in front of them. Back to Melon and March. Let's say I had painted every single piece without tracing and gave credit to the photographer and model for every painting. Let's say I had done everything properly. Someone still could have assumed that I had traced, yelled at me in the comments about it, accused me of lying and being a stinky bitch, and because I work digitally and because my portraits are realistic, I would have no way of proving that the work was mine, even if it was 100% true. If you took some of the paintings I did that were not traced and laid it over the original photograph, it actually would look similar enough to argue that I had traced, even though I didn't. That is a huge problem. And I know I sound super paranoid right now, but I have very good reason to be so cautious. My day jobs for the past few years have all been social media marketing, management, and a bit of public relations. I have tons of experience dealing with people causing mayhem online, thanks to one person making a completely inaccurate, based on no evidence whatsoever claim. Here's how it works. One person will get an idea that something is bad and make a public comment about it. The comment will plant doubt in everyone else's minds, and some will take the accuser's side. This spurs on the accuser to make even more more ridiculous claims and even more people jump on the bandwagon. Literally in a matter of minutes, an angry mob of people will form and your innocent post will now have a crazy long comment chain of outrage over something that isn't the slightest bit true. I've seen it happen all the time. And take it from me, had I not responded to the commenter that called me a stinky bitch so quickly, that comment easily could have turned into an angry comment chain like I just described. Handling social media dramas is a very delicate art that really only provides a couple solutions to the problem. If someone comments something and you manage to catch it when it happens and you have ammo at the ready, such as the thumbnail drama I just told you about, you can make one comment and that'll be that, nipped in the bud. But in our world of cancel culture, there aren't too many easy situations like the one I just described. Certain topics like race, sex, politics, or anything remotely sensitive have to be handled with great care. When it comes to handling internet drama of any size, you really only get one shot to make amends. If you hastily put together an explanation or apology, you risk saying or implying something you didn't mean, and the mob will call you out. They'll actually use your response to further prove their claims. If you try to correct your mistake with another comment, now you're sucked into the argument and you look even more guilty. If you wait too long to respond, the mob may get out of hand and your late response will make people think you were crafting an elaborate lie or that you didn't care or that you're still hiding something. So when Melanin March started this month, I realized that I had accidentally created a very, very sticky situation for myself. Again, I didn't go into this thinking I was gonna trace, so it obviously never would have crossed my mind to make a disclaimer or something. But let's get real. Even if I had decided to trace and had decided to post a big disclaimer, people still would have quietly judged me. I wouldn't have gotten nearly as many likes because they think I was cheating and their opinion of me as an artist would drop. It was only on like day seven or something when I realized that I could either trace or not trace and still get an angry mob either way that got me sweating. So here are the options that lay before me on day seven. Option one. I could have created a whole separate post explaining that from now on, I would be tracing and providing appropriate credit in the description. And the credit part would have been extremely difficult, but we'll get to that later. And A, 
Some people would have been totally fine with that and moved on with their day, but more likely B, people would have immediately judged me. Maybe they wouldn't have said anything in the comments because not everyone is very outspoken, but they would now consider me an unskilled, lazy, cheating artist. And if you don't believe me, think about how you felt earlier in this video when I revealed that some had been traced, or think about how you felt when other tracing scandals came to light. Once that seed is planted in your head that maybe this artist isn't as good technically or morally as you think they are, it's very hard to go back. If B were to have happened, I could have written a long ass comment explaining my intentions, trying to calm everyone down, trying to salvage my reputation. But the problem with social media is that there's always a character limit. This video script that I'm using right now is over 11,000 words and I can't condense it without leaving out details and nuances that are important to my side of the story. Plus, it would have looked like I was backtracking or being defensive and it wouldn't have been a very good look. No matter what, my second response would at best look sloppy and at worst look suspicious. Option two, I could have announced on my Instagram on the last day or even later that I had been tracing, but then I'd be met with basically the same reaction as option one, except this time people would actually be outraged because they'd think I had been deceiving them this whole time. Their opinion of me would lower even more. Option three, I could never tell a soul and feel incredible guilt for the rest of my life for lying by omission, even though tracing isn't all that bad like we previously discussed. But then of course, if someone did find out later, I'd be in huge trouble for lying. And I don't think my social media skills could get me out of that one. Option four, I could have kicked the idea of tracing out of my head, not traced at all, slaved over every line and been bitter for the rest of the month because my moral compass was keeping me from making my life significantly easier. I would have been miserable all month, felt terrible when I inevitably had to quit the challenge, and that feeling of failure would make me fall deeper into this art block that I've had for several months now. Drawing every day and seeing myself improve in the specific areas I wanted development in has been hugely rewarding and great for my mental health. And especially with this virus wrecking havoc on anything considered normal life, this challenge has been really pulling me through this tough time. But get this, even if I had spent the whole month not tracing, people still could have made a false claim that I had traced and I'd have no way of defending myself. Trace or no trace, there's always the potential for trouble. Option five, I could have completely shifted gears and finished the challenge with a more cartoony style, but again, would have been very bitter about the whole thing and it wouldn't have allowed me to practice the things I wanted to practice. Or option six, I could have created a behemoth YouTube video outlining literally every single detail of this conundrum in hopes that you all will understand and maybe walk away with a better, less toxic view of tracing. Well, guess which one I picked? <laughs> I chose to create this long ass video so I could control the narrative first. I don't wanna feel guilty by not admitting to all that I did trace, but I also don't wanna simply say that I traced and have you all rage against me or potentially rage against me without at least offering a more nuanced perspective. I don't want pitchforks, I want conversation. Now, there's always going to be that one person who's convinced that artists should exclusively use their own work and will argue, well, you never should have done Melon and March in the first place then. And if this sounds ridiculous to you, you're right. And if you think that no one would actually say that, you're wrong. In one of my last videos, how to edit shitty photos of your artwork into something decent, I got an angry comment from someone who thought it was wrong that I used a print of someone else's art as demonstration instead of my own art, even though I credited the artist multiple times and stated over and over again that it wasn't mine. When I told them that I'm a digital artist, so me using my own art really wouldn't have made any sense, they ranted that if I couldn't use 100% my own art, that I should have never made the video in the first place. Some people are like that. And with cancel culture getting more and more toxic lately, it seems like even more of those kinds of people exist. In my opinion, you have to look at the big picture and decide if the pros significantly outweigh the cons. In that example, me not using my own work but properly crediting them in the video isn't nearly a big enough offense to justify not creating a super informative video that could literally help thousands. And in the case of Melon and March, me using other people's photos isn't a big enough offense to justify not pushing a movement that supports more representation in the art world. Copyright. Now you may think, well, can you really call it your own work if you traced someone else's photos? And that's where this shit gets real murky. You would think that by moral compass alone, it'd be clear what is and isn't your art, but people are actually very divided on the topic. What one person says is fine might be hugely offensive to another. I decided to do some research into copyright law to see if there were any rules in place to make this distinction a bit more clear. Copyright isn't black and white. There are different categories where your artwork could fall into under the copyright umbrella. The examples that I know of are infringement, misappropriation and fair use. I'm going to very briefly explain these terms for the sake of background information, but I can't slash won't go into any real detail because one, I'm not a lawyer and I, as a lay person, have a hard time understanding the true distinctions myself. Two, this video is already super long. And three, 
Google is free. Heck, go down to the description box for a bounty of links that will provide all the information you could ever want from real experts on the topic. So infringement. This is when you traced or copied something that's protected by some kind of copyright. It's more of a general term. If you misappropriated the source image, then it is possible you committed copyright infringement. Misappropriation. This is when you copied protectable elements of the work and a general audience would consider the final product substantially the same. Fair use. Fair use of a copyrighted work is not copyright infringement. There are a few important factors to consider when determining if something is fair use. One, how much did you transform the source image? Fair use considers if you transformed an added value to the source image in making your illustration. Two, what impact will your work have on the market for the source image? The greater the impact on the earning potential of the photograph, the less likely it will be considered fair use. At first glance, these rules feel pretty direct, but the second you do even a little bit of digging, the whole facade falls apart. Not even copyright lawyers can tell you for sure whether your work is misappropriation or fair use because everything is taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Let's take a look at this forum I found called Avo, where people can ask a question and, and lawyers from around the country can weigh in. One person asked, is tracing a photo in Photoshop copyright infringement? And said, I'm an illustrator and I want to use photos from the internet such as swimsuit models or MMA fighters as models for tracing the human figure to cut down on production time. Photoshop allows one to paint and draw over photos in a layer that is above the original photo. If my end product is my own digital painting that came from a tracing of photos that I did not take, can I sell these digital paintings and drawings or would this be an example of copyright infringement? And I was so excited when I saw this question because it sounds very similar to the dilemma I've had with Melon in March this year. Four lawyers replied and here is a brief summary of their responses. I mean, if your end product has only used the outline, it might be the case that it would be near impossible to even notice, let alone claim infringement. But if it were much more obvious, a copyright holder is always free to drag you into court and force you to defend that use. This won't happen if your work is truly transformative, of course. If your end product is substantially similar to the photographs, then you would be infringing a copyright. Notice the vague language being used more obvious, truly transformative, substantially similar. No one has listed out instructions like copying the outline is okay, but you must color it differently or something along those lines. Instead, all these lawyers are saying is, well, it depends and I'll know it when I see it. In fact, that's literally what all of these lawyers said in their comments. Take this one, for example. It is difficult to answer this question without seeing an example of what you're talking about. One of the rights protected by the Copyright Act is creating derivative works. What you are describing sounds like it has an element of infringement as a derivative work, but I am wondering if the end product would be in any way identifiable as coming from the original that you traced. If it wasn't visible as such, then maybe not. But no one on here is representing you and can give you actual advice on this. You would need to consult someone one-on-one one and provide an example of what you have in mind, as well as the photo you are using to get that end product in order to get an actual opinion on whether it could be a problem. One argument could be that the photographer who took the photo did not create the shape of the person, only the setting and arrangement of the photo and choice of subjects, so the shape is not protected by copyright. Shape is not protected by copyright? <laughs> what the hell does that even mean? But when you look at the laws and look at other copyright cases, it becomes very clear that because there aren't any clear cut rules, everything comes down to morals and how good the lawyer is. Let's look at some different examples. One case you may already know of is the Obama Hope poster case that was finally resolved in 2011. Artist Shepard Ferry used a photo of Obama taken by the Associated Press and created the iconic red, white, and blue graphic image that adorned websites, posters, stickers, buttons, and more during the 2008 election. Ferry argued that he had effectively transformed the work into an idealized image that created powerful new meaning and conveys a radically different message. The AP still argued that because Ferry had not bought the license to the photo, that it was still copyright infringement. After two years of heated debate, this was the final decision. According to the settlement's terms, the two sides agreed to work together going forward with the Hope image and share the rights to make the posters and merchandise bearing the Hope image and to collaborate on a series of images that Ferry will create based on AP photographs. Financial terms remained confidential. Now, there's obviously a lot more details to this story and I encourage you to read the links in the description if you're curious to learn a bit more, but the bottom line is that neither side conceded and that there was no real winner per se, they just now had to share rights to the work. Let's look at another example. The Karyu, I believe it's Karyu, 
Cariou versus Prince copyright case of 2014. Patrick Cariou is a photographer who took black and white photographs of the Rastafarian people in Jamaica back in 2000. Eight years later, visual artist Richard Prince created a series of works that included altered versions of Cariou's photographs. And by altered, I mean blurred, resized, changing the color and compositing of other photos and images, etc. The Southern District of New York ruled that Prince was infringing. They were not transformative and because Richard Prince did not claim to be commenting upon the original works. Prince appealed to the Second Circuit, and in that case, they reversed the ruling and stated that most of Prince's works were indeed transformative to a reasonable observer and therefore fair use. In particular, the court found that the lower court erred in requiring that the appropriating artist claim to be commenting on the original work and found works to be transformative if they presented a new aesthetic. So yeah, two courts, same copyright rules, two completely different outcomes. <laughs> Like I said earlier, because there are no hard and fast rules about this, even in the damn court of law, it all comes down to people's personal opinions and how well they can argue it. I learned about both of these cases from a webinar by the Graphic Artists Guild. The guild is a very respectable guild of different kinds of artists, and they support artists around the world by offering information on pricing, contracts, copyright support, and lots more. I watched this particular webinar in an illustration class, and you can watch it for yourself by clicking the link in the description. And let me just say, even though the people leading the conversation were very knowledgeable and did their best to present everything clearly, me and everyone else in the class walked away even more confused than when we started. And I truly don't think it was the presenter's fault. It's just that the laws themselves feel vague and contradictory. And certainly when you learn about those two cases, it's hard not to throw your hands up and be like, well, why do we even have these laws in the first place if shit like this can happen? Unfortunately, rules are rules no matter how ridiculous they are. I'm not saying we should play anarchy and just copy away. I'm simply bringing up these rules and contradictions because I know for a fact that someone will try to argue that you should just follow the copyright laws and that's the solution. I wish it were that simple. Pretty much every article and video I found of lawyers discussing copyright laws say something like, the only way to know for sure is to have a lawyer look at it, which as seen in the previous examples is still not a strong enough answer because lawyers can and will disagree. You could argue that by providing proper credit, you're saving yourself from a potential lawsuit, which by the way, you're really not. But even in that area, things can get kind of dicey. For example, when it comes to copyright of a photograph, whoever took the photo is the owner of the copyright, not the model. Unless of course it was a true selfie where the model actually took the photo. The model does not need to be credited, legally speaking. This also means that if some girl on Instagram got her boyfriend to take the pic, the copyright would be in his name. And considering I've never once seen an IG model credit their photographer consistently for every single post, I wouldn't be able to properly, legally credit the owner of the photo for my illustrations. That information just straight up isn't available. That said, most people assume that crediting the model is just as important as crediting the photographer, even though there isn't any legal obligation to do so. Unless of course the model and photographer signed a contract with one another stating that the copyright of the work goes to the model, but how the hell would I, well, someone on the outside, know that. So in the next few examples, I will be talking about the difficulty of finding the model's information as well as the photographer's. Platforms like Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr are great for finding images, but most users on those platforms just save and repost random content without providing credit. To try and find the original artist becomes this slog of going from one user to another, praying to God that at the end of the rabbit hole, the very original poster actually has all the information you need. And guess what? Not all artists are on Instagram. Plenty of these users just find the art from somewhere online or in the real world and they post it on their page without credit. You literally can find the original source only to discover that it's not actually a real source and you still don't have the information you need. And something a bit ironic that I've discovered is that professional art, like editorial photography, tends to be easy enough to find credit for. It's selfies or pictures of random pretty girls that you can never find credit for. Most of the models for this year's Melanin March were actually just selfies that I found online. It felt more transformative taking a selfie and turning it into an original work of art than taking a fashion photo shoot itself a kind of art and turning it into an art of my own. But these pictures get spread all over the internet from fashion pages to aesthetic pages to curly hair pages to God knows where. And no one credits the girls because it doesn't feel like art. It doesn't feel like something copyrightable even though these people are technically stealing someone's work by reposting without permission. Here's another very annoying situation. Indigenous or tribal photography. That is the devil. Back in 2018, I decided to draw people of different cultures around the world and I needed photographs to accurately portray a person's facial features, clothes, clothing, face paint, etc. I thought that this wouldn't be a very hard task, but by God it was. 
If you Google a specific tribe, you'll get a plethora of images, some being of the tribe you're looking for, but most being tribes that are in no way related to what you're looking for. I remember looking up an Asian tribe and seeing images of a South American tribe. Also, lots of pages get the tribe wrong in their description of the photo. The exact same photo can be labeled as three different tribes on three different websites. It's absolutely maddening. And that's just figuring out what tribe you're looking at. Actually finding the photographer and the model Forget it. Photographers are so rarely credited either because they're professionals whose credit got lost in the cyberspace or because the photo was taken by a tourist or missionary or something and they never bothered to credit themselves in the first place because they didn't see these photos as artwork. It's the same as the selfie situation. Something that doesn't seem to warrant credit blows up online anyway and no one can track down the original artist. As for the models, that's almost an impossibility. Tribal photographers tend to title their work as girl of blank culture and not actually provide any names. The odds of you actually finding the model's name is slim to none. And what about historical photography? That gets even more challenging. Getting an appropriate credit isn't always as easy as it looks. As a side note, when preparing for Melanin March this year, I compiled literally hundreds of photos I found online to potentially use as reference. Because I didn't know what image I'd use each day, I didn't want to waste hours of my life tracking down the owner of all the hundreds of photos I found only to end up using 31 of them. And because I'm not as organized as I'd like to be, I never had the time during March to find and give credit at the time of posting. However, by the time this video comes out, I will have provided credit for every post, at least to the best of my ability. If something is still uncredited by the time of this video and you know the photographer or model, please let me know so I can add that information. To go one step further beyond just crediting, what about getting the original creator's permission? Surprisingly, I haven't found a ton of information on that and that's likely because very few people actually do get permission, either because they didn't think it was necessary or because they literally couldn't find who to ask or maybe were too shy to ask. X could be the case. If you were able to contact the right person and they were cool with you tracing, you'd still have to make some kind of written agreement with the original creator to cover all the bases, like the ability to sell and distribute your altered image. Again, I truly don't know what the rules are on this. Considering how few people actually do it, let's focus on the vast majority of cases where permission wasn't asked or granted. One of the biggest ambiguities about tracing is the line between what is and isn't yours. According to copyright laws, Things in the public domain, facts, and ideas are not considered copyrightable and can be traced, collaged, manipulated as you please. For example, you tracing a photo of a plant, a type of insect, car, building, mug, etc. is fair game. But when I read this law, I couldn't help but wonder if celebrities fit in this category. Think of all the thousands of photos there are of George Clooney or Kim Kardashian, for example. At this point, we probably have photographs or film stills of them from every possible ang angle and lighting condition. My question is, if someone traced over the image of a celebrity, or maybe didn't trace but made a realistic portrait of a celebrity, would it even be possible to find the source photograph? Or to make this question even harder, could someone claim that an artist had traced by finding a photo of said celebrity that happens to match the artwork, even if the artist didn't trace or even use that photo? Again, there are literally thousands of photos of celebrities and famous people, so who's to say exactly what the source is? In the Obama Hope poster we talked about earlier, artist Shepard Ferry had long given credit towards the photo he used, which is why he found himself in hot water with the Associated Press. They had proof that he used their image. But had he not credited the photograph, would anyone truly know what photo he used? Wouldn't that image of Obama just get lost in all the other photos of Obama? Had he not made that artwork at all, that original photo wouldn't mean very much and no one would think twice about it. It's just another picture of Obama. But once art is made, and once there's a link to the original source material, suddenly that artwork is poised for comparison and criticism of whether or not the artist transformed the material enough. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying you should burn all evidence of what source imagery you use to get away with tracing. Most articles written by lawyers recommend being transparent and cautious when tracing. I'm only posing these questions and scenarios because I do legitimately wonder what the outcome of a case like that would look like. So these rules and laws all stipulate that the work must be transformed enough, but what does that even mean? As we saw with Fairy versus Associated Press and Cario versus Prince, it's very difficult to say for sure. Let's look at the law. Fair use, according to the US Copyright Office, allows the unlicensed use of copyrighted work under certain circumstances. In other words, there are some situations where using copyrighted work without permission will be allowed. Common examples of fair use include using a selection of the work for criticism, news reporting, teaching, or scholarship. There is no set formula for determining whether something is a fair use. The courts make this determination on a case-by-case -case basis. However, they typically take four main factors into account. One, the purpose and character of the use, including whether it was for commercial purposes 
purposes or whether the new work was transformative. A transformative use is one that adds something new to the original work, changing its character or furthering a new purpose as opposed to substituting for the original work. Two, the nature of the work used, such as whether it was published or unpublished and whether it was creative or factual. Three, the proportion of the work used in relation to the whole. Use of an entire work is less likely to be considered fair use than use of a small portion of the work. Selections constituting the heart of the work are less likely to be considered fair use. And four, the effect upon the original work's potential value. Does the use harm the existing or future market for the underlying work? One of these points I want to expand on a little bit is the nature of the work being creative or factual. Let's hear what this lawyer had to say. Copyright doesn't protect things in the public domain, facts, and ideas. Where this often plays in with source imagery is that the reason you are tracing is to make things look realistic. You are tracing a photograph of a monkey because you want your viewer to know that they are looking at a monkey. No one can copyright the proportions of a monkey. Proportions are natural and thus fall into the facts category. So we need to keep this in mind when determining how similar the source image and your illustration are. This makes a good amount of sense, but I wonder if celebrities would fall into the public domain or fact category. I painted Michelle Obama and AOC because I love them and they're awesome. I traced because these are very important people and I wanted to be sure that my audience knew who these people were in the portrait. Considering their enormous public image, would it be possible to use this as a valid argument? Food for thought. I'm showing you now my Melon and March painting is compared next to the original source imagery and you can see which ones are more transformed than others. Some of my paintings combined a couple of different photos just to add to the complexity of my particular problem. I'm sure right now you're making your own judgments as to which pieces are deemed fair use and which ones are stealing. And because the internet is how it is, I can't and won't stop you from stating your opinions in the comment section free speech and all that. But I do hope you realize how silly it is to try and compartmentalize what's good and bad by opinion alone, by what your moral compass is telling you, because ultimately everyone has their own opinions. Some people's opinions like lawyers and judges mean more because they're supposed to be unbiased and following the law. But we've already seen a case where the ruling went both ways depending on the court. Because the law isn't transparent, we're left only with opinions to make the call. Conclusion. Tracing, in regards to using finished content as part of your process for another work, doesn't have clear-cut rules to follow. It's a complete gray zone because it's very easy to cause offense. People act like it's black and white because that's just what we humans like to do. We like to compartmentalize, generalize, create order and structure, but the world of art and aesthetics can't be treated that way. I know it's a maddening topic, at least it certainly is for me because even after the hundreds of hours I've spent creating this video, I still don't know if the art I've created this past month is safe. I still feel like my art could be condemned by anyone at any point. Even just the act of creating this video of defending tracing, I feel like I've taken a baseball bat to a hive of bees. But Damn it, I really think this topic and all the other topics that branch off of it, like copying, selling, copyright law, etc., deserve to be talked about and debated and really fleshed out. I feel like tracing has become a taboo topic, and it's really not fair to demonize something that has its pros and cons. Tracing has a rich history going back all the way to the Renaissance, yet we never say a word about it. Caravaggio, for example, used pinholes of light to project models onto the canvas so he could trace. Art historians have known this for a very long time, but you've probably never heard this fact. I suspect that the fact that great artists traced is being treated the same way as the fact that ancient sculptures were originally brightly painted. It's a fact that we may have proof of, but we really don't want to admit it because it goes against our perception of them. Renaissance artists were masters. They didn't trace. Greeks and Romans had sophisticated taste. They didn't paint their statues in loud, tacky colors. It's all in the same vein. The fact of the matter is that a lot of famous artists throughout history have used tracing or at least transferring as part of their artistic process. But because we inherently don't like tracing, we don't teach or talk about that information. My theory is that thanks to social media, giving millions of people access to millions of images a day and smartphones allowing us to take and share photos instantly, it is simultaneously the easiest time to steal and share content to a crazy huge audience. It's no wonder that copyright lawsuits have been on the rise in the past century. People have more access than ever before to use and appropriate other images. But although the times have changed, our values when it comes to the ethics of tracing haven't changed much. Even though I've discussed all the positive aspects of tracing, like its ability to teach and its ability to speed up artistic process, and have discussed how copyright laws aren't nearly as strict as you think they are, you may still walk away from this video still thinking that tracing is inherently bad and should be avoided at all costs. To this, I say that's totally fine. Everyone is free to their own opinions. 
But let me summarize all the points I've made in this video in case you may have forgotten some of the many positive or at least nebulous aspects of tracing. Tracing is a complicated topic slash technique that cannot be dismissed, encouraged, explained, or condemned in a mere few sentences. I think it's wrong for people to be so immediately judgmental of tracing, especially without taking the time to learn about the artist's decision to trace and form a full comprehensive perspective. Copyright lawyers have to review copyright suits on a case-by-case -case basis because there's always unique factors to be considered. So why should you, someone who maybe hasn't heard the whole story, be so quick to judge when a lawyer would not judge the same case so flippantly? I also think it's wrong to teach tracing as a teaching tool without fully explaining the repercussions if done in inappropriate circumstances. Tracing has a very long, very complex history in the art world, made all the more convoluted by social media and copyright laws of the current century. My hope is that this video has at least planted a seed of doubt in all you diehard tracing haters. I don't don't think that tracing is the best thing to do all the time, but to just automatically condemn tracing without giving it much thought is, to me, not very fair. Tracing deserves at least a fair argument from the opposite perspective, and I hope this video has offered that perspective. <sighs> I know this video seems incredibly long, but there's actually a ton of other information that I either barely touched on or had to cut entirely. That information plus every single source I used for this video are all neatly organized and linked for you down below so you can learn more. And I cannot urge you enough to continue learning about this topic because all the stuff that's in the description box is fascinating and eye-opening to say the least. Now, my hands are so cold and I'm a little tired, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it gave you a little something, something to think about, like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz, and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys.